you're, you're an executive coach, you're a speaker and you're an author, but you're also a social impact advisor and also a community, community creator. How did you start your journey? What was the catalyst? Well, it's a lot of things, isn't it? And I think um, there's a lot of conversation in the marketplace today in regards to um, putting yourself in a box so that you're easy to consume. And I think one of the challenges uh, around all the good folk on this call is that you know that you are capable of so much more than one thing. Uh, and so when people say you are this, a this, a this, a this, and a this, um, I say, yeah, uh, as are most people. Now, that's not the same as just kind of the parts of us that we commercialize and turn into our businesses. Um, but at any given point in time, we do get to change and evolve and grow. And I think one of the things that I'm most excited for in life is uh, just being on a wild growth journey myself. That's what we do. Um, my practice is called Switch Learning and Development. Uh, and yes, we're executive coaches um, and we lead people in very real ways to understand um, who they are and to build on Pauline's thoughts that there's a, a beautiful intersection between what it is that you're capable of doing, that's your skill, and who you are as a person. And I think everybody on this call has met somebody who has a lot of skill, um, but perhaps not as much substance that is necessary to really harness that skill. I think everybody's encountered uh, somebody in their life or their work life, either in their own team, somebody that they've worked with in the past, somebody they've reported to, or maybe it's a client or a partner as well that are just wildly skillful. And that's not the thing that either, you know, drives them forward or not. It's their ability to manage their emotions. And so our work is really helping people um, manage themselves emotionally and manage themselves as a person uh, so that they get to play with their skill. Now, how did I get into that? Uh, I don't think we have enough time, uh, but truth be told, my dad uh, is a Baptist pastor, so I grew up around uh, people who use words for a living, and I was able to watch uh, as to see what is possible with words, and that's really what we do, is we get people to have conversations with themselves, conversations with their teams, and usually in those moments, uh, good things happen. Great. And, and so taking that a little bit further, uh, here at GG, our mission is to deliver a generational uh, and timeless work-life frame. Uh, mm. So tell us, what's your mission, Phil, and, and um, how important is it to have a mission in both business and life? Yeah, look, it's an, it's an interesting question because um, potentially mine is a, a, a provocation on a frame that is really, really important to growth gen. And so I want to be careful because I'm your guest here. Uh, but one of my favorite uh, questions to ask people uh, that I'm working with and whether they are um, C-suite executives and typically our work skews to Fortune 50s. And so we spend a lot of time in deep conversations with people who are deeply established in life, who are worth you know uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and have teams of tens of thousands underneath them. That's the, the size and the scope of our clients. Um, but one of my preferred questions after we've established a bit of a working report is, is this what you expected that you would be doing? Is this what you saw for yourself when you got into the world of work? And almost to the person, you know, whether they're third, in their mid-30s or their mid-40s or their mid-50s and beyond, um, people are often surprised at what life has in store for them. And so I think that's the beautiful part of understanding what's the purpose of my mission What's the, pur the purpose of the vision that I have for my life? And the way that I suggest people take a hold of that is that really having a clear focus on what it is uh, that you see for yourself is more about the trajectory than it is about the target. And I'll say it again, it's more about the trajectory than it is the target. Because I've seen people, um, you know, get what it is that they were going for. They might have set themselves a goal 10 years ago and they got it. Um, I'm really glad that I am not the living embodiment of the goals that I set for myself 10 years ago. Why? Because they were made by the version of me that was 10 years into the past. And I know more now and I'm a better person and I'm kinder and I have more courage and I have more wisdom and experience. And so there's this forever process of constantly updating what it is that we see for ourselves and aligned with that, our forever purpose of updating our goals and our visions. So do I believe in a mission and a vision for our own lives? Absolutely, wholeheartedly, but only if it's constantly up for grabs. 
I have a personal rule called six weeks stupid, six weeks stupid. Hopefully it means that hopefully I'll be able to always look at myself six weeks ago and think I can't believe I used to do it like that uh, because I'm committed to this story of growth and evolution and change. Just one more kind of like hammer uh, on top of that nail is uh, Muhammad Ali, the great boxer. He said that the person who at 50, uh, if they were the same person they were at 30, has wasted 20 years of their life. And I, I really like that, uh, not because it's a judgment on people's lives, um, but it's an invitation for us to evolve and change and grow. So, yeah, I love vision and a sense of purpose and mission, uh, but I like that it's constantly up for grabs as well. Reference to sport, uh, and that reference to sport really resonates with me. I'm a huge sports fanatic, um, but I'm also, having worked in the corporate um, arena for most of my career, I'm acutely aware of how important it is to have a playbook, both for yourself, yeah. but also yeah. your team. Uh, so yeah. could you share with us uh, the key elements of your making it count, make it count playbook? Yeah, for, I mean, from a, for the, an understanding of making it count, which is really about understanding what matters most to you. So this is drawing on some pretty uh, good old fashioned wisdom, right? Which is that if a person is gonna build a house, there's an ancient fable that, that is really short one that says this, that if a person is gonna build a house, you know what they should first do is sit down and calculate the cost. Um, and it's this idea that sits right in the heart of understanding what it actually takes to pull off great things for our life. Because I have ambition, I have aspiration, and so do all the beautiful and good people on this call. It would be a shame for us to set out on an adventure or a quest or have a goal for ourselves and not have first counted the cost. So we know that these two things is that having a, an idea of what it is that we're trying to achieve uh, is really, really important, but also being uh, able to, to build around at the architecture of success. And so from a, a meaning-making perspective, your ability to make it count is really, really critical. Um, if everybody's taking notes or if anybody's taking notes, I want to like maybe just drop something here that I find time and time again, is that for anybody who is working really hard, but without sufficient clarity on what it is that they are working for, that's a really dangerous scenario. And the, the two risks here, and this is what I'll get you to write down, are drop out and burn out. Can everybody write these down? Drop out and burn out. Drop out and burn out. Now, if you're taking notes, these would be useful hooks. And I've been in exit interviews, and, and I don't mind uh, sharing that this is um, one set of exit interviews, which is this perennial issue that we keep facing with one of the high potential groups we work with. It's one of the major technology organizations in the planet. We don't need to kind of call out who they are, but suffice to say that this place is a playground. It's, it's a dreamscape for talented young people. And so I remember I've been sitting in exit interviews before, you know, where people have resigned and they're on the way out. We want to know why, because we're paying them a lot of money, like a lot of money. If you are close to 30 and getting hundreds of thousands of dollars and getting paid, you know, back in the day before COVID to travel around the world and, and play in this field of dreams for talented people, we want to know why. And one of the big pieces of feedback is, well, I just didn't think that I would have to work this hard. I just didn't think that I'd have to go this hard. And for me, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting kind of dilemma because we understand all the good people on this call. We know that work is almost always hard work. Is that fair? Yes or no? Like work asks something of us. And, you know, when we're at work, we're working. And on the weekends, we usually think about work and a lot of the emotional roller coasters of life comes out of the relationships that we have with people in and through work. And, and so working hard is a bit of a given. And so when I hear that people have exited or they've exed out of a career or switched into something else because they're frustrated, um, what I don't hear is it was because of the work. What I do hear it was that the work wasn't worth it. And let me just kind of like take this a little bit further. Like if you and I walked into a store and were buying something of great value, we wanted to spend a lot of money on something that was of great value because work is a, is a high cost. And so this is the, the analogy that we're working with here is that we pay a high price for work. And the price that we pay at work is in our time our time, our energy, our attention, and our effort. It's a high price to pay. So I really want to know what it is that I'm getting for the price that I'm paying. 
And this is the emphasis, I guess, of Growth Gen is helping people to get really clear on why they go to work. Because without clarity on what it is that you're working for, you risk either paying too much or underpaying and never getting it at all. And so I found that this is a really common scenario. And so for the ability to make it count, um, first and foremost, you need an understanding of why it is that you go to work. Now, that doesn't have to be material goods, but I don't care if it is. For some people, they want a beautiful home and they want to be able to send their kids to good schools. And some people really, really want a, a supercar. I don't mind what it is that drives you to go to work. Um, it matters that you know what it is. Uh, for me, the, the why of work is actually more about the who of work, who I am working for. So the people that I coach and the people that I lead, but mostly my children. I've got two beautiful children and an amazing wife. And so the who I go to work for matters as well. So right, right, right at the heart of making it count is understanding why you go to work. That doesn't have to be some grand spiritual quest. It literally uh, is as simple as identifying um, what matters to me and why I go to work. That's the same for me. It really resonates with me, that, that whole piece around, you know, who you are and, and, and why you go to work and, and who you're working for. Um, your, your playbook also references um, this concept of talent stacking. Uh, could oh, you explain man. that to us in, in a bit more detail uh, and how it's key to optimising trajectory in business? Yeah, I think this one's an important one because there's a lot of rules in regards to talent. Everybody wants to know, like, do I have what it takes um, to succeed? The answer is yes. Um, the answer is yes. By uh, most adult stages, people have more than enough in order to thrive and survive. It's not a question of how much you've got. It is, uh, am I bringing the best of it to the right circumstance at the right time? And so often uh, the metaphor that I use uh, so regularly is of baking a cake um, you know, if success in our, in this metaphor is the same as a cake is produced, uh, then the ingredients are, are not crazy. I mean, you, you really only need four ingredients to bake a cake. You need flour, you need sugar, you need eggs, you need milk. That'll get you there. Uh, you know, maybe a, a couple of other things if you want to like have a specific cake, but it's not so much the ingredients, it's the sequencing. It's how you bring them together. It's how you put them together. And so that really, really matters. I mean, I could scramble the eggs with the milk. I could put the flour on the bench and I could like eat some sugar. I have the exact same ingredients, but I don't end up with a cake. And so talent stacking is not too dissimilar to that, which is taking a real kind of almost a scientific look. And my version of science in this regard is a dispassionate curiosity about who I am and what I've got to work with. So if you're taking notes, those two words will serve you well, a dispassionate curiosity. So who am I? How am I showing up? Um, what skills do I really have? Not what are my potentials, but what have I got to work with? And then how do I combine these in a way that get me closer to what it is that I see for myself? Now, the old idea about talents uh, is a strengths-based approach, and everybody's heard of this. You know, this is Marcus Buckingham. God bless Marcus Buckingham, the baby-eyed or the blue-eyed baby-faced assassin. If you don't know Marcus Buckingham, one of the great thought leaders of our time, former partner at McKinsey who wrote uh, a really, really important book called First Things First. And it was all about working your strengths. His second book was now Go Work Your Strengths. Um, which was this idea that you first have to work out what do you do that is better than anything else that you do and invest a lot of time and energy and effort and attention into doing those things. I mean, if I was to build a visual graph here for a moment, so everybody will have to look at the screen while we do this. He said this, if you're going to stock take all of your skills, um, and if this was like a table, you'd have some stuff that you're already really, really good at, some stuff that you're okay at, and then there's a limitless list of things that you're no good at. Um, and what people tend to do is get emotionally involved with the things that they're no good at and overlook the strengths that they already have. His suggestion is to deeply invest into our strengths so that they become this towering strength so you can become the best in the class. Now, I understand that, but everybody on this call now has intimate experience with the fact that the world changes. And I know people who have over-oscillated to one or two aspects of their talent 
uh, in ways that are really quickly snatched away from them by external circumstances, either the business changes, the market changes, the product base changes, or the entire economy changes. And the thing that they had as their towering strength, the only thing that they knew how to do disappears and becomes less viable. So my approach to talent has always been a talent stack where you take two or three things, preferably three things, and remix them in such a way that you have something that only you can do, that is very special and personal and important to you. So say for instance, uh, if we were in a room, we would all model this together, but uh, by way of just some really quick example, my talent stack, I call it a public educator, and you'll see um, how useful a talent stack is in a moment. So in my talent stack, there's three things. Think of it as kind of like three intersecting vents. And one of them is research, one of them is public communications, using words to change people's lives, uh, and the other would be marketing. Like that's my talent stack. So when I think about what do I do, I read stuff, I think about stuff, I talk about stuff, and I make sure that people know that I exist, right? The value of a talent stack is, is that if I was measuring myself against each one of those things, am I the best in the world at it? Not even close. Am I the best researcher in the world? Not even close. Am I the best public speaker in the world? Not even close. Am I the best marketer in the world? Not even close. However, when you mix them together, you end up with something very, very formidable. And especially when it we're able to apply it towards a mission. So the idea around talent stacking is just very quickly taking the time to think about what are the three or four things that I do really, really well. And when I put them together, what do I call that thing? And how can I amplify that thing? The upside of a talent stack is that over time, if the circumstances change or my ability to resource my talent stack uh, shifts, so say for instance, research, it is less and less valuable for me to spend so much time doing research when I'd much rather somebody on my team do that research for me. So now uh, I get to substitute that thing out for something else and I grow and change according to the needs of my business and the needs of the marketplace. So I like uh, the approach of having a talent stack much more than I like the approach of having one strength, which is so inherently risky in the year 2020 and beyond. So much powerful insights in, into that just alone that, um, and that, that piece around talent stacking is something that um, I had not heard of, but it's, it's such a powerful and, and interesting topic that um, you know, I hope people will, will, will take forward. Uh, on that last point, on that point around taking it forward, Phil, um, at GG, at Growth Gen, we, wanna, we want our delegates to, um, to make it count. Mm. What is your one call to action for our delegates today to make it count, particularly in these times? Mm, um, one things, one things are always tricky, right? It's like saying, hey, what's your favorite movie of all time? There's, there's lots of good things that we could say, but I think probably the thing that comes to mind first and foremost is spend time in reflection. Um, daily self-reflection is the master skill for people who mean business, uh, people who want to do something really valuable and significant with their life. I mean, over the last uh, 30 years, let's call it 30 years, 30 to 40 years, we have done such a wonderful job of uh, deeply embedding uh, the value of feedback in our organizations and teams. I mean, this is me putting on my HR professional's hat. Feedback is a no-brainer. Um, but I would love, I would invite everybody to write this down if you could, that feedback without self-reflection is half a data set. Feedback without self-reflection is half a data set. And when I say data, just for pronunciation, data might be helpful as well, D-A-T-A. -A. But feedback without self-reflection is half a data set. And it's this idea that unless we are taking the time um, to observe ourselves with dispassionate curiosity as we go through life, we're going to miss opportunities for uh, easy improvement. And I know people who check in with themselves uh, once a year and they call it a New Year's resolution. They take stock of what they did in the year and what they're going to do in the year to come. That means there's 364 days between check-ins. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always found that the, the tighter the feedback loop, the faster the growth. 
the tighter the feedback loop, the faster the growth. So for me, the most valuable and important thing that anybody can be doing right now is really reducing time between check-ins. And so that just turns into like daily self-reflection. And whatever your daily self-reflection takes the form of, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to make some recommendations. I have, and this is not a plug, uh, because I'm happy to gift this to anybody that would like a copy. But my book is called Convergence, and it's all about some really simple self-reflection, some questions that people could ask themselves um, every single day that drive them forward. If you would like a copy of that, I'll send you a digital copy, Care of Growth Gen. Um, and so do me a favor, if you'd like that, why don't you just throw your name and your email in the chat. Uh, we'll get somebody from the team to collect those and share with everybody a copy. But there are five really, really simple questions uh, that people could ask themselves every single day. Uh, and the first, uh, I think, uh, it, most powerful is, did I try today? That's a really powerful question. Did I try today? And that'll start to lead you in the right direction. And it's not for self-judgment. Uh, it is an opportunity to ask ourselves, uh, how are we showing up? And did I bring my best to the day? So, self-reflection, I would say, Muff. Thanks, Phil, for um, such a generous, generous offer and, and, and supporting course. Growth Gen and our, and our attendees today. Um, uh, we really appreciate that call to action is, is such, a, such an important thing to take forward, isn't it? Uh, for me, certainly, um, another saying on that is feedback is a gift, but it's what you do with that gift that, that counts. Um, yeah. And so that self-reflection thing is something that I'll take forward as well um, yeah. uh, post, uh, post today. So thank you so much, Phil, for joining us today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, and for everyone, um, for everyone on the call, um, really, t please do take up that offer. Um, drop, drop your line, drop your emails uh, into the chat box. And um, we, we do appreciate your, your time today, Phil, and sharing your insights. Everyone, please join me in thanking Phil. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. Wishing you all the best and every success.